Hello and welcome to What is True. <clears throat> welcome, welcome to a study of the book of Ecclesiastes. I, uh, interrupting the study that uh, Brother Don and Bruce are engaging in, I want to say this about my study today. I want to give a tribute to Brother Bob Owen. He is the, the individual I first heard this preach uh, and never forgot it. I was a young man beginning to uh, seek to do the work of an evangelist and it was the foundational lesson he used in a gospel meeting where I attended and I used it ever since then to open any meeting work that I have and I teach from it all the time. If I'm studying with an atheist, I go to the book of Ecclesiastes. It talks about life under the sun and it also just makes an observation about man. And he uses the term, what prophet has a man? In that question, what is man? Why would God be mindful of him? And is God mindful of him when we see what we're up to, what we're up against? Because we see human being, but the reality is the Ecclesiastes writer is trying to see us what it means of being human. And that being human simply equates to this. We are created in His, His image. And from us being created in His image, being human, we're human beings distinguished by a more highly developed brain, a resultant capacity for articulate speech, and abstract reasoning. And that is the book of Ecclesiastes when you observe life under the sun, when he begins to observe that all the things that he could acquire and desire, once he had them, he even referred to them as I hate them. Now that doesn't seem to go with the pattern of our thinking is human beings. And so the book of Ecclesiastes is going to chap challenge us to come to an understanding of the temporal nature of life because in chapter 1 and verse 3, what prophet has a man of all of his labor which he does under the sun? One generation comes, another generation passes away, and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever and the sun rises to the uh, the sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rose and the wind goes around on its circuits. He's talking about the cycle or the circle of life. And now that one generation, my brother Bob is in hospice and I pray for him and his comfort, his peace, his hope, for him to be encouraged. And then for me, you know, as a, you know, you begin to look at the chronology of who's next. So I need some abstract reasoning because it seems to be rather bleak that all of these things are falling apart. Morsi and I were in here 20 years ago taping this TV program and here we are. Life is a vapor. It appears for a little while and then it just it goes away. It's nothing left. It was just something that was there and is no more as I teach at the nursing home, at the retirement community. And I explain to them after being there 11 years uh, and holding a 2.30 service for them that this entire congregation has disappeared and here you are. Not one of them was there when I began. And so we start looking for these uh, truly penetrating statements the New Testament said it this way, the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed. Of all the discussions that I had with my father in his latter days, that was one of the challenges that he spoke to me about that he had. He says, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Is that true? Is that how you feel? Then we begin to see the equation. The light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Ecclesiastes is going to teach us that. 
Why? Because when you look at the things that are seen, they're terror. It's, it's not good. Vanity and vexation of the spirit. It's breathing heaven. But at the things that are not seen, these things are eternal. And so we begin to see past all the brick walls that exist. But what we learn as we live is that, you know, all things become old. You got the Roebuck Sears catalog. Some of you kids don't know what that is. You got your Amazon now. But, you know, every year you got to go back. But in 75, I was looking at something for me. And in, you know, 95, I'm starting to look for something for my children. And then you come to this point every year, and especially where we live in land of abundance, and you got to ask the question, well, what do you want? What, what do you want? And if we go through the list, we, you know, the truth is, I don't know what I want. Because Solomon said, you know, come now, I will test you with mirth. I will joy pleasure. Surely I, this is also vanity. So in chapter two of Ecclesiastes, he's saying, I'm going to go live it up. And I said, laughter, madness, mirth. What does it accomplish? And so he's saying in this state of party atmosphere, what shall it done? And he, then he said, I stretched out my heart to gratify my flesh with wine and guiding my heart with wisdom. He didn't lose it. He tried to keep it, keep it all together. And he even gathered works, all the money that you can imagine. He had male, female and male singers in chapter two and verse seven. And he gathered for himself silver and gold. He was the richest man on the planet. What do you want? It's, I don't know. Because it didn't bring me lasting happiness. Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power. Is knowledge power? Because he says, in chapter one, as you read at the end of the text where he's trying to understand everything, he says in verse 18, in much wisdom is much grief and in the increase of knowledge is increase in sorrow. And, that, you know, chapter 12 and verse 12, the end of the book, he says to the end of this making of a book of writing a book, there is no end. But in the human experience, in wisdom, that is when we begin to gain insight into what's going on in the world, he says, there's grief. And he who increases in knowledge, increases in sorrow. What he's telling us simply is this. It's not bad to know, but the more you know, the more you know to worry about. And the more you know about the things in this world that are indeed temporary. But we can't seem to grasp why we go from knowledge to knowing temporary, to looking at our garages in our abundance. And the more you have, the more you have to worry about. That's what he says. I have knowledge. Now I have abundance. And now he says, I just, I've got too much stuff. The end of the story is, is that I even hated what I've got. I hated life. When he began to simply look at material possessions, whether it be in, in the knowledge of the things of this world or whether it be in the possession of the things of this world, he came to this conclusion. I hated life. Why? I hated all my labors, which I'd taught. Now, we're getting ready to learn that labor is the key, enjoying your work is the key to life. But he said, I hated my labor in which I'd toiled under the sun. Why? Because I had leave it. Now, the, the, these are the things that he had amassed. This is the thing that he had gained, he acquired. And I'm going to leave it to a man that will come after me, and who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. He said, this is vanity. This is breathing heaven. This is breathing nonsense. Therefore, I turned my heart to despair of all the labor which I had toiled under the sun. He gets to the end of his life and looks at all that he's accomplished and goes, oh, what was that about? Because I can't take it with me. And he said, even in the night, his heart takes no rest. I still remember the heart spasm I had, and I had an expensive motorcycle, a custom bike in the garage. Uh, excessive, ridiculous. And in my mind, somehow, I had the thought of dying and then the thought of what would my wife do with my nice motorcycle. You see how it's, it's the more 
you own, the more you risk losing, the more insurance you have to buy. These are the principles that we know, but we just don't really acknowledge them until it's too late or we just never really learn it. We just keep chasing it. And that is that if you love silver, you'll not be satisfied with silver. He who loves abundance with increase. And this also is striving after the wind. It's nonsense. And so we get to a level playing field in all the things being taken away. And chapter 5 and verse 12 says, the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Now we had the man that had plenty or uh, an abundance and it, his heart takes no night, takes no rest in the evening. So 512 says the sleep of a laboring man. Now we're going to get a, a little clue on how to get a good night's nice rest. Right? Sweet sleep. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. So there's a time for every purpose under heaven. So when you begin to calculate all that is in the world, for me, for you, and for everyone on the planet, there's a time to be born and there is a time to die. And this is life, isn't it? That's kind of the end of the story. But not in its totality. The book is Life Under the Sun, but in chapter 3, verse 11, the text says, He has made all things beautiful in His time. With that being said, what we learn is that we have a timetable that we live in, in which there is time for laughter and weeping and mourning and dancing and gathering stones and throwing away stones, embracing and refraining from embracing. In other words, all the things we can calculate into the experience of life, many of them being extremely negative and bad and hard. He comes in and says that he's made all things beautiful in his time. And as we've made that opening statement about human beings being human. He has put eternity in our hearts, chapter 3 and verse 11, except that the no one can find the work that God does from the beginning to end. We begin to learn in this state of mind regarding life under the sun, how to trust in our Redeemer and Creator. And that is how we begin to see that things can actually be beautiful in his time. And light shines in this dark world only when God is acknowledged. And that's the brief summarization of what the Ecclesiastes writer is seeking to find is as he sets out as the preacher to find out what profit it has a man from the toil which he gave under the sun. What is the profit? And the amazing thing is when he says everything beautiful, well, then that puts you at work because he's looking at the labor. He's looking at the things that make us tired. And he's already said the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. How do you get a good night's rest? By being that guy. And the only way you can be that guy every morning, every night, living that one day at a time is because you realize that's all you got. Because there is our time and there is his time. And his is on the plane of eternity. So we turn the page. Life continues. Chapter 3 actually makes the observation there. In the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. And he says, this is vanity. And then we jump up into verse, chapter 8 and verse 14 about injustice being real. And, and he even observes it. This is the Bible explaining the things that we complain to God about. He's going, there's a vanity which occurs on the earth. And that just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. And there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. 
And this also is foolishness. It's breathing heavily. It's nonsense, but it's a part of where we live in life under the sun. Not only that, but if you, I, I tag it as 9-11 because, you know, many people attribute, well, some people got out, some people didn't, I guess, wasn't their time or God didn't have mercy. These are the kind of things that we begin to rationalize in our mind. Ecclesiastes 9.11 says the race is not to the swift nor the bread to the strong nor riches to men of understanding nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to us all. And while we factor in all of the things that occur in this life, the thing that is most difficult for us is just to realize that we can be at the wrong place at the wrong time. We can make a decision that puts us in that place or it can be happenstance. We can be in the wrong place. And those are the things that we factor into life under the sun. What makes a sad man happy and a happy man sad? Thank you, Randy Frazier, for giving me this some time ago. What makes a happy man, a sad man happy and a happy man sad? Think about your condition today. Are you happy or are you sad? Because the prophecy, uh, what could I say? And that is simply this. And the Ecclesiastes writer tells us this. This too shall pass. A sad man, we can make him happy by saying this too shall pass. A happy man, we can make him sad by saying this too shall pass. But you know the present did not come to stay, but it came to pass. And that is the same for us. Our destination. All go to one place, all are from the dust, all return to the dust. Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 20. Very hard to get through the book in 30 minutes, but we'll, we'll take a, a speed course here for nine minutes. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 5. When we, when we talked about the abstract reasoning, put the peg down here because most of you are sitting in your homes watching this or you'll be going to your homes in a little while. You always think of, well, I need to get home. Well, yes, you do. But Ecclesiastes, the end of the book, talks about remembering your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. Bob, we know what the difficult days look like and feel like. And then you can even get to a point where physically you can just say, I have no pleasure in them. And it talks about all the things that happen to the body as it begins to fall apart. The end result, though, is the man falls completely apart. He's going to disappear. What happens? For man goes to his eternal, I like the way the King James said it, to his long home. We're not home yet. And if we can lay that to heart with the deepest of sincerity and being content, then we're going to have many things that will bring us great strength. Being human, remember? Abstract reasoning, being able to think. And people talk about thinking outside the box. You just need to look at what the Bible says if you want to see outside the box. Better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Wow. What a powerful sentence and how true it is and how it flies in the face of everything you could ask me in an hour. I'm teaching this class and you get me around 11 o'clock and say, hey, Dennis, what you want to do? I don't want to go to the house of mourning. I want to go eat. We all have that idea. Well, you know, I can't wait till we have this gathering and we can all just have a big and, and we love them and they are something that we engender in our relationships and we can see that in the scriptures in these scriptures in chapter 7 we're going to see in a minute better to go to the house of mourning better to go to the funeral than to the potluck and look at our country look at our churches the last thing, we recoil when we have to get down into a circumstance of mourning.
But what does the scriptures tell us? That pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. That's mourning. That's a house of mourning. Where are they? You see how the struggle can continue to be so difficult in maintaining who we are. And so we just start talking about what is our circumstance. And this is how <clears throat> it becomes truly amazing. Wherever you are in your life, whatever you've experienced in your life under the sun, what the Ecclesiastes writer has said is that there is in this physical existence a limited lifetime and that there is the certainty of death and that he says in the purpose of those things in this light of life under the sun, he said it's vanity and vexation of the spirit. So here we are looking for an answer to what he wrote to the book of Ecclesiastes in life under the sun because there doesn't seem to be anything that would lift us up. But that house of mourning, the end of all men, what does it consist of? See, that's the critical key. You know, many of us get involved in this life so desperate that we think, oh, I, I need a miracle to get out of this. I need a miracle. In, Ecclesia, in, in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, the Apostle Paul said, you know, the mir miraculous spiritual gifts were for a purpose, and that was not to fix you in this life and give you heaven on earth. He actually said those were to confirm the word to bring us all into this unity of the body. But then he says, you know, about love and how that we could maintain this optimism that he teaches, that it is kind and it doesn't envy, it doesn't parade itself, it doesn't, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, isn't provoked. You know, those characteristics that we want to display while living before we die. And what we learn in these is through faith, we have purpose in living. We walk by faith, not by sight. In hope, we have vision beyond death's door. And in love, now these three, the greatest of these is love, that will abide. It consists now, it exists now, and it will consist of what heaven is. Giving purpose to life, giving purpose to death, now abides these three. That's what the Apostle Paul, when he said, I will show you a more excellent way. And in that way, back to the Ecclesiastes writer, the admonition that we have, and this is a, a real challenge to everyone. And that is, I've seen it good and fitting that a man should eat and drink, enjoy the good of his labor all the days of his life, which he has under the sun. It's his heritage that every man who has been given riches and wealth and given the power to eat, receive his heritage. And this is what he says, rejoice in labor. It is the gift of God. So we come to the conclusion of the matter, fear God and keep his commandments the end of the book, it really challenges us just to lift up to the next thing that Jesus was teaching us. Because, you know, you come to that conclusion and, and it seems to be, wow, that was a little abrupt and I don't fully understand exactly what that means. Other than the fact that I have acknowledged everything is temporary. But when the Pharisees, when they came to test Jesus and we have everything that would regulate life and love and liberty given in the law, you know, that is, it would bring us to Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 22, 36, that what was the great commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. On these hang all the law and the prophets. The fulfillment of everything that we struggle with is here. And we have to come to an absolute con conviction of, of the things that he has prepared for us. The deathbed request from my father-in-law is simply this, a cup of cold water. 
And you read at the bottom of the Bible that I bought with the money that I, I had when we did the funeral. Had not been a Christian, but for just a little time. He did not live a Christian life. His wife passed away. He knew he should do it, and he obeyed the gospel, confessed Christ. And he asked me on that day, take care of my babies. What do we have? Just the desire. The little things in life that mean so much. At the Good Shepherd, I'm not going to show him because he's a good friend, but this man right here, he lives in a little one-room place in a facility. And the end of all men, the living will lay it to heart. If you're fortunate enough to live long enough, maybe you'll be in a place like that, and on 2 at 2.30 in the small dining room, we'll gather together and we'll worship God with these other 200-year-old women. And what we will discover in all of that is we are dust living on the edge of excitement. And whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. It, it, I, you just got to realize that this man got up out of his chair. I mean, how hard it is to get to worship. He put his suit on when he discovered that we were going to have services. He had led singing in his life when he was able, and he comes in with a song book, and he opens it up, and we worship God, and that, my friends, is life under the sun in faith in Jesus Christ. May God help us. Join me for what is true. Go to the YouTube channel. Check us out at the Little Rock Church of Christ if you have an opportunity. Have a blessed day.